Hello and welcome to the NC podcast. My name is Natasha Collins and I am the founder of NC Real Estate, which includes its members club for landlords and property investors to come and build a profitable property portfolio that completely aligns with their goals. And just a little tip right now, I am going to put the members club waiting list link below because you are going to want to be on it. Mm, A little birdie just told me we're almost ready to launch. So just as an FYI, the Members Club is opening within the next couple of months and we only open a couple of times a year. So if you want to be first on that list and being on the list brings you a couple of little surprises, I would click the link and sign up now. That's ncrealestatemembersclub.com. I will put the link below. So make sure you get on that list. Okay, today I have another incredible guest come to speak to me today. I'm so, so, so excited. She's one of my favorite people. Whenever we get the chance to meet up, we have the best conversations about different things around self-improvement, ways to make work-life balance great, and also just general amazing catch-ups. Parita Bordania, hi! Hi! Hello. (laughs) I'm really excited as well to to be speaking to you today. Oh, me too. (laughs) So for those of you who don't know Parita, I just assume that everybody does because most people that I talk to, Parita, you're very well known within the industry. (laughs) Parita works at Lionheart and you run all the, the events, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, Lionheart is the charity for RACS professionals, their life partners and children that are dependent on them. Um, So we are actually a separate organisation to the RICS um, and we support um, RICS professionals right from APC stage throughout their career and once they've retired as well. Um, So just to kind of give you a bit of background, um, for those of you that may not know the services that we actually offer and what we do, our services are bespoke to what the individual may need. Um, So people might come through to us for kind of a variety of different things. It could be anything from a period of unemployment and struggling to get back into work. It could be relationship difficulties or having caring responsibilities for a sick elderly or a disabled relative um, to struggling with stress, anxiety um, or depression. So we provide support in a variety of different ways. Um, So through our dedicated team of support officers, through um, our qualified professional counsellors and through our ever expanding portfolio of of workshops and webinars um, and these actually cover anything and everything from kind of mental health awareness to general well-being so things like resilience work-life balance and financial education for all um, age groups so we'll always find a way of how we can actually help and support people so that's just a bit about Lionheart. You guys do the most amazing things just a bit of a background I came across Lionheart uh, six years ago I think like 2014 and um, I was really struggling with my mental health overwhelm burnout and the RICS put me in contact with Lionheart and they really helped me through a series of counseling sessions and I am forever grateful for that because it turned my belief in the industry around I think. Yeah, um, and I actually remember actually saying that it feels like it was such a long time ago. Um, <laughs> but I remember actually when you came through, and I remember I th- met you after um, you'd passed your APC. Yeah. Um, and I remember us having a conversation about really wanting to do something. And I know Natasha, you were really passionate about um, kind of wanting to give something back to the industry, but actually also um, to kind of helping and supporting APC candidates because you understood what the journey felt like. Um, and I remember we kind of met up and we kind of had a chat and we did a kind of a mind map of potential things that we could do and actually that's when we came up with the seminar supercharge your well-being do you remember that yes yes <laughs> I was I literally we I, when I found mine height it was like I just needed to do something and tell everybody about it because I'd had such a tough time with it and then I got in contact with you and I and you came back to me and I was so surprised I was like really you want to run with that <laughs> I think I'm, I'm one of those I like I'm a very passionate about you know the work that we do at Lion Heights an absolutely amazing charity and I just feel like you have to sometimes run with ideas and you have to just make it happen and and see where it takes you and and, and I think that's actually what's happened with Supercharger Wellbeing is we kind of came up with this idea I think through you know several conversations we then decided actually let's do a seminar um, you know we want 
people to kind of we want it to be practical and we want it to be interactive and we want people to really take things away from it um and we just i think yeah i remember our first pilot we delivered that at racs headquarters and we had a lot of people in the room <laughs> um, but it was absolutely amazing to see that actually so many people had attended and that, that there was actually a need um and there was more that we could do it was just um yeah it was absolutely amazing i remember that that first one we didn't know how many people were going to come we had a table <laughs> for what was it 10 people and 10 to 15 yeah <laughs> and like 32 people showed up and oh, we were God, blown God. away and I remember you standing in the corner and me leading it and people just keep coming in behind me as I was yeah. talking and I had no idea really what I was doing the imposter syndrome at the time was full on because I was like how on earth am I leading something on well-being and all of these people have turned up to listen but you're right it was just a response it was almost like this cry from the industry help yeah. we need something yeah no definitely and I think I um always think back to that but I think that just kind of showed us actually that there is a need and actually since then you know that was the first of many workshops that we have um delivered so we've you know we've delivered supercharger wellbeing now um all over the UK and we've actually even developed the 30 minute supercharger wellbeing webinar which has just been a huge um success as well and actually more kind of recently um we've been doing a lot of work with our kind of corporate partners so they will host workshops internally yeah. as part of their APC induction program uh, kind of over the two-year period so um you know, I'm so grateful that you actually contacted Lionheart, that you really wanted to do something because it's just been the start of an, an absolute incredible journey. Um, we've actually developed two further um, workshops as part of the APC series. So we've got Supercharge Your Wellbeing. Um, and then secondly, we've got Boosting Your Resilience. Mm -hmm. um, so I think resilience can, is, is such like a buzzword and um, we're, we're just kind of expected to have it. But the, the seminar actually goes through what is it, how how um, do you get resilient and um, why it helps you. So it's all about kind of what is stress, how can that affect you and what can you do about it? So um, that's the second one we developed. And then the third one, which was developed with you um, as well, Natasha, was building your confidence. Yeah. Um, so I think confidence you know, is a learned behavior. It's a muscle that needs kind of, you know, regularly being exercised and, um, you know, you need to be able to kind of be flexible with that. But in the workshop, you know, we kind of, it's practical ways of how you can change, take charge and develop your confidence. And I think it's um, a skill that really helps, you know, not just during your APC, but when you're going to sit your kind of APC assessment, because that can be a, a really difficult time for people, I think. Yeah, well, I, I think the one thing that I have, notice that holds people back is that confidence and you're right it's a muscle because there's no way that we're born with this ridiculous con confidence to stand up and tell people about what we do I, yeah. I I find that that's been that's been one of the things that I always struggled with I still sometimes to a certain extent I'm like yeah you know I just do these things and kind of get on with it and walk on never never really celebrate what I am and like shout about it. And I think everybody yeah. is like that. And being able to just stand up and tell people, and it doesn't matter if there's one person in a room, it doesn't matter if there's hundreds of people in the room and say what you've got to say and actually be proud of yourself and have that belief in yourself that you are just as good, if not better than everybody else is something yeah. that needs to be shared, right? No, I, I definitely agree. And I know that we've had absolutely amazing feedback. Even when you were um, in the UK delivering the sessions, you had a lot of people kind of follow up with you after as well, didn't you? Yeah, people were coming yeah. to me and saying, I, sometimes they say to me, I can't believe that you struggle with confidence. And I definitely do. Um, I put out, an, I actually put out a podcast last week that I did not want to go out. I had sleepless nights about it because I was. it was about how my rage within the industry and sometimes I get really angry over things and don't know how to deal with it. And so I just did a podcast about that and I was bricking it and then it went out and actually nobody said anything. And I thought even, I don't know, people were going to be like, how do you how can you possibly think that you're a leader if you feel this angry and you can't control yourself? And um, I... I don't know, that was imposter syndrome. And that was also me doubting the fact that I had a valid opinion on something. I don't normally get that worked up about things. I'm a pretty placid person 
when I, I guess my public persona is very much more placid because I I think about things and very considered in the way that I feel things. It doesn't mean that behind closed doors I'm not like raging sometimes. But so yeah. people come to me and they say, well, how do you do it? And I kind of have to fake it sometimes until other, I believe it. And I don't yeah. really care whether other people believe it. I have to believe that I'm confident. Actually, yeah, and that reminds me um, of a of a quote that I read earlier today by Oprah Winfrey, which is, um, you become what you believe. You are where you are today in your life based on everything that you've believed. So if you believe that you can do that, then you you can you can do anything actually yes yeah yeah oh I love that <laughs> See, I'll have to send you that yeah. Parita <laughs> always comes out with the best things we're having these conversations she's already armed <laughs> with these quotes yeah it, it's <laughs> just weird how it happens <laughs> <laughs> Yes. And I think, and I think confidence is also quite a big part of mental health because you do have to be, you have to find some confidence to stand up and say, hey, I need help. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, I think it's important that should we actually kind of go through what we mean by mental health? Because I think yeah. that can mean different things to different people. So yeah. often um, we can hear the term mental health and our associated thoughts can be negative. So, and they really shouldn't be. Um, we all need to start thinking about mental health differently. It's it's something that we all have just like our physical health. And in the same way that physical health can change from day to day, so can our mental health. So um, to gain a better understanding of mental health, I think we should think of it as a continuum and appreciate it's something that we're going to move along throughout our lives, depending on what's going on for us. Um, so mental health actually covers our emotional, psychological and social well-being and it affects how we think feel and act um, it can determine how we might manage stress how we might you know make decisions how we relate to people um, so I think I mean if I was to ask you if you were on the positive end of the um, continuum of mental health you know what are some of the things that you might be able to feel or, or, or that you might be able to do so you're asking me that question yeah so yeah if I so today I'm having a real positive mental health day yesterday I Wilson is like almost flipped the switch o overnight so today I'm feeling good about everything I'm I'm like yeah I turn up I do my podcast I would I I show up as me <laughs> ready and feeling good in what I'm doing I did a lecture yeah. this morning at 7 a.m and I was happy about that and I'd already been to the gym and then I went out dog walking with one of my friends. I came back. I was having a good conversation with uh, one of my fellow lecturers and I was giving him advice. He was giving me advice. I would, got through my emails really quickly. I was just decision making and I was able to yeah. do things. Whereas yeah. yesterday morning, I'd woken up just feeling grumpy, annoyed. Um, and I was... All I had to do yesterday, really, my first job of the day was to make sure a decorator was going to go to one of my flats and paint a door. And you have no idea how tough I'd made it for myself. I'd literally, all I needed to do was send a text message and tell him what paint colour to take with him. And, <laughs> and I literally, you have no idea, I'd, I'd typed to my my mom about how this decorator couldn't done any so I'd whatsapp her and be like this decorator can't go and get his paint I'd said to Chris I wish I was back in the UK so I could sort this out right now I'd just do it in an hour I'd led on the sofa and got fed up about it and then I was like what on earth are you doing right now why are you in this mood I was like just text the guy tell him where to get the paint from you could even phone the paint paint the de painter and decorator and say do you have this color paint make sure it's there and lo and behold this morning I had a text message that it back done we'll be there 7 a.m monday morning I mean, the difference <laughs> in 24 hours. I think, I think that's it. So you've just um, kind of briefly touched on. So when you're kind of feeling um, generally good, you're you've generally feeling content. So that's yeah. how you're feeling today. So that's what kind of like the positive end of the kind of continuum can feel like where, you know, you're able to express a range of emotions. You're able to build and maintain positive relationships, um, you know, coping with everyday stresses and challenges that, that might come your way. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just, you know, you 
generally kind of feeling good. Um, and I think when we look on the other end of the spectrum, and again, this will be different for different people. Um, it will be based on, you know, kind of how things are going for you. But it might be that, you know, you, you're no longer able to enjoy the things that you once did. Um, you might feel um, withdrawn or detached um, or you can't think clearly, um, mm -hmm. you know, feeling hopeless or having a loss of energy and, and motivation. So it's, you know, we need to kind of really um, work on and think about actually what what does that look like for us? You yeah. know, when we're having a generally a really good day, how, you know, how do we feel? And when we're not feeling so great, how how are we feeling? And I know that we're going to be discussing a little bit more later on about ways of how we can actually boost our mental health and how can we kind of work on that. Um, but yeah, I thought it was quite important, um, you know, for the listeners, listeners to really understand what we mean by mental health and, and to remember, actually, everybody has mental health. You know, it's just our kind of, it's just the way that we think and the way that we feel. And there is absolutely no, um, there really shouldn't be no stigma around that. No. So, um, you know, I know that we've, I mean, we've all heard of the stat, you know, saying that one in four people will experience poor mental health um, in a year. And about two thirds of people with mental health problems um, actually believe that long hours, unrealistic workloads or bad management have either caused or kind of worsened their condition. Um, and I know when we did our Lion Heart survey, actually, um, a lot of the reasons that came up were the long hours, the unrealistic workloads, um, you know, things being swept under the rug um, and not being spoken about. So, you know, it is really important that we have conversations around mental health. You know, what does that actually mean and what does that kind of look like? Um, I just want to really quickly kind of go through um, kind of three questions. And I just want you to, you know, guess what the answer might be. Because okay. um, I know that when I kind of had a look at this, I was kind of like, oh, I didn't know that. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna, so patients with depression and anxiety make up approximately what percentage of GP appointments? Do you think it's 25%? 52% or 70%? Mm, 52%? Okay, so it's actually 70%. Oh. Um, so, yeah, depression and anxiety make up approximately 70% of GP appointments. Do you know why I'm surprised about that? Just just why? putting it out there is because I know, like, my when I've had really bad anxiety... I also worry about the fact that nothing's that I shouldn't be being like that. So I wouldn't ever go to, wouldn't have ever gone and sought advice because I'm like, well, it's not that important, you know, based on yeah. other people are dying. So for, yeah. for me, my anxiety was that my gosh, I'm worrying and things are going around in my head and I get very obsessive, um, compulsive thoughts. But I would always then caveat that with the, well, I'm not dying, so why would I go to the doctors? So that yeah. stat, in it's a way, is, yeah. is good because people are at least going to get it diagnosed. My gosh, yeah. I wonder how that's I, changed. I think the other thing to remember is is, is when you have um, poor mental health or mental ill health, there can be other things that kind of um, happen as a result of it. And so sometimes when things kind of get really bad, you know, it's, it's like you really do need to go. Um, the second question that I wanted to ask was what proportion of people with mental health problems experience stigma? Um, 90%, 10% or 50%? Mm. Fifty percent, but again, because I don't know that people would tell anybody. Like, do you know the shame? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's actually 90%, which is really shocking as well but um a time to change uh, research shows that actually up to 90 percent with mental health problems experience some form of stigma stigma so whether that is from friends and family at work um in education or even during treatment um it's one of the main reasons people feel like they're unable to talk about their mental health um they just would rather not tell other people really perhaps not knowing the kind of response that they're going to get and especially you know now you know the kind of sayings that you hear is oh just man up just deal with it or oh just get on with it or you know you, you sometimes think that you're just going to sound silly even if you did mention it to people mm -hmm. I, I know that one I know that one I've yeah. of, I've often said that in times when I am feeling the worst I've probably achieved a lot because rather than 
getting it out by telling people I go hell to leather working new projects this that and the other to try and distract my brain so that I don't have to tell everybody because again it's the thing of well it's not as bad as other people so why would I talk about it but actually talking about it is where you, you but you have to be in a safe space to talk about it you couldn't talk about it with everybody and I've, I've certainly no. experienced it in um in the property industry I remember um years ago and this is a story from years ago and probably one of the reasons why I allowed myself to get so near to burnout was one of my clients um for a massive estate and I went I'm not going to go into to details of who and what but um she was signed off with um, stress um, for a couple of months. And you'd go to these meetings, these boardroom meetings, and they'd all be laughing about it, the fact that she'd gone to buy shoes or something. I was like, what? She'd probably be yeah. ill. But it's, it, you know, as a young surveyor, I was in a, and I, I must admit, I didn't speak out as much when I was younger as I I do now because I'd be in a room of all these important looking men who'd flown in because it was an international trust and they would they would almost be ripping that person to shreds and then you must the guilt that you must then feel when you come back to work my gosh like I so I've I've seen it firsthand and it's terrible but it also comes from the fact that people then like well you've been signed off so why do I pick up your why do I have to pick up your work yeah I think a lot of that is changing um I've kind of noticed that in the last couple of years since we've been doing a lot of work with kind of our corporate partners um where a lot of them are kind of taking this you know really seriously um it was I think it was just the other week where we had one of our um one of our potential corporate partners where they had the mental health awareness and managing mental health workshop delivered. And that was with their managing director, um, three of their regional directors, and then all their area managers. And it was just absolutely amazing. And absolutely, it was just so great to see the conversations in that room and, and all of them actually taking that seriously about how can they better support their staff and their employees. Um, So I think, yeah, I think, the last couple of years yeah there's a lot more work being done a lot more firms and organizations are focusing around kind of you know their well-being strategy um and really kind of looking ways of how can they how can they actually apply that and what can they do so um yeah I think still we've still got a lot of work to do but there's definitely been definitely been some change so so Um, just to segue a couple of weeks ago I had um Alex Pang who is a rest researcher who came on the podcast and he was talking to me about some of the work that he was doing in Silicon Valley and he's working with um, a big corporate firms uh, to reduce the working day to six hours four days a week do you think we'll ever get there with the property industry <laughs> don't know about that <laughs> um, I, that I, ideal, but... <laughs> I mean yeah, he, he's again and actually after this we can switch contact details because he is looking for people in the in the property industry to do that with. But how amazing if we start moving towards different ways of working as well, because everybody that I talk to in the industry who's still very much embroiled in the corporate in the corporate side of things is always like I am just overwhelmed with the amount that I've got going on right now. It never stops. It's just emails flying left right and center it's paperwork here then they're everywhere and we've got a lot of paperwork to fill in as surveyors so yeah I would be so interested to see how this starts changing people's working patterns and I know we've got a way to come because it doesn't it doesn't happen instantly I would always like to click my fingers and things happen instantly it doesn't yeah (laughs) yeah I think especially nowadays as well I mean firms are really looking at what benefits that they can offer to um, employees especially with the younger generation coming in because you know it's not just about the job title and the salary that they're concerned with they want to know what are they going to be you know what more are they going to be getting what about kind of working from home or flexible working Mm -hmm. it's just not enough now to kind of offer a salary Um, so I feel like yeah there's, there's a there's a lot um, that potentially may change. It might be slow progress. Yeah. Um, I don't know how quick, but yeah, I think um, a lot of organisations are looking into different kind of benefits and different things that they can offer to their employees. And so, you know, it's not just about offering it, but it 
there's, there's so many benefits that have kind of been shown up in research in terms of productivity level and performance. And, you know, all of these things are so vital in a working environment. Yeah, I agree. Um, but yeah, so the, the just moving on to the last question, um, which was, how long do the majority of people with a mental health problem wait before telling their closest family and friends about it? Is it over a year, two months or seven months? Definitely over a year. Yeah, you got that one right. <laughs> so um, yeah, 60% of people um, with a mental health problem wait over a year to tell the people um, that are actually most closest to them. And I think, you know, th- these were just to kind of give um, give you a flavour of, of some of the stats out there. And, and I know Know that there's so many other common ones where we know that you know 70 million workdays are lost annually due to mental health. Mm-hmm. Um, 15 percent of, of people at work have symptoms of an existing mental health condition, and I know that a lot of people will use work as a way to kind of continue and to carry on and to yeah. keep going, but it is something because that we do need to focus on not just as as the property industry, but you know, beneath our job titles and how much money we earn and our relationship status, we are people. Mm-hmm. And mental health is something that affects everyone, not just a particular industry, which is one of the main reasons why we definitely need to start focusing on mental health and, and well-being and what we can actually do to kind of help people and support people with that. I agree. I agree. And it's also such a hard thing to articulate. Yeah. I'm yeah. I'm not good at explaining how I feel. And sometimes I'm like, well, it's like the red mist of doom just starts settling in and I can feel it closing in and there's not really too much that I can do about it at the time until, I I don't know, I've I've completely changed my situation. But it took a very long time to be able to tell people about that. And also what I've realised is that people who have panic attacks, for example, have panic attacks in very different ways. So oh yeah, yeah, I used to, as a teenager, have panic attacks, which I realized now were panic attacks. But at the time, I just thought I was having a heart attack. Um, whereas, uh, whereas other people experience that with, uh, you know, they get all red, and you, you can see yeah. you can see the redness coming up. I know that some people um, kind of double over. Some people even go as far as passing out. I've seen some people pass out. Uh, I've heard some people pass out from it, and it feels very differently because people get pins and needles or um they feel like they're they just cannot breathe anymore which was a symptom of mine and um and I think that's the other thing is that it's so hard to describe yeah I think yeah it's really important like you said everyone's um version of when if if they have a panic attack is going to be very different so you know, we know, you know, there's anxiety, there's depression, there's um, di- different types of eating disorders and different OCDs. Yeah. There's just so many kind of a variety of different uh, mental ill health out there. And the versions of what people might experience will be very, very different. But mm-hmm. what the key thing is, is actually kind of understanding what your own symptoms are and how you can manage those better. And I think the second is that's about yourself. But then secondly, understanding and knowing that everyone else will deal with things very differently to you and and not to actually compare people yeah so I think you know that's really kind of important and so when you know when we think about the mind the mind is a muscle that we use every single day um, you know to be productive at work to be effective at home to be creative in our businesses or whatever it might be that we're actually doing and so just as the body needs to eat, exercise and be engaged to get stronger, so does our mind. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, talking about kind of like the tips on working on well-being and mental health, you don't have to be struggling with anxiety or stress or pressure to focus on boosting your mental health, just as we don't need a physical challenge to go to the gym. You know, you don't have to have a mental challenge to actually go to the mind gym. So, you know, I think being proactive about our mental health is the best decision that we can make. And the truth is stress is something that none of us can avoid. We will Mm -hmm. all experience stress at different levels, at different times throughout our life. You know, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's family challenges, um, you know, whether it's finances, it's something that we all go through. So I think the most important thing to do is firstly, you need to kind of have and develop self-compassion. 
So, you know, think about how you would talk to a good friend or someone that you really love and that you care about. If they are going through a difficult time or if they're just generally struggling, what would you say to them? You know, what's the language that you might use? What's the tone of your voice? Mm -hmm. You know, we would be very kind of patient and, you know, empathetic and understanding, right? Yeah. And I think you have to think about, you know, when you're having a bad day, when you're struggling, how do you talk to yourself? Is it positive? Is it negative? And I think a lot of research just show that generally um, we are so much more critical to ourselves. Um, so I think the first thing to do is actually to remember to treat yourself as you would treat a good friend or someone that you love and that you care about. Um, I think another 